like, listen, here's what's happened. You're likely never gonna walk again. You're never gonna use your arms again and your flying career is over. And something inside me was like, I'm just gonna prove you guys wrong. I think there's so many steps you can take as an individual out there whatever your background and whatever your injuries or ailments may be, but you have to take it upon yourself and recognize there is no easy solution. There is no pill that you're gonna take that's just gonna magically fix you for the rest of your life. It's just not how it works. You have to take it upon yourself to heal yourself and you have to really want to heal yourself. Welcome to Merge. I'm Ryan Graves. Today, I'm joined by Kagan Smurf Gill. Kagan is a former U.S. Navy F.A. 18 Echo pilot. In 2014, he sustained devastating injuries from a high-speed ejection into the sound barrier, surviving the fastest ejection in the history of naval aviation. After over a dozen surgeries and two years of rehab, he returned to flying Super Hornets. Today, he is an ultra-endurance athlete, motivational speaker, veteran advocate, and he's completing his first book while raising a family. He's on a mission to heal mind, body, and soul through alternative modalities. Please be warned, this episode contains descriptions of severe physical trauma and may not be suitable for younger listeners. And now, Keegan Gill. I have with me today, Keegan Gill. Uh, Keegan, uh, we're gonna hear so much about your story, former F-18 pilot. Uh, in Foxtrot or Echoes? Uh, Echoes. Awesome, Echoes. And uh, you were flying off the coast of Virginia Beach, correct? That's correct. Awesome. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, what squadron you're with and, and where you were in the Navy and a little bit about your story. Absolutely. Um, so I was stationed uh, initially with uh, VFA 143, the Pukin Dogs, mm-hmm. out of NAS Oceana. I think we were there very similar times. Yeah, I think so. Um, as a J, uh, uh, J.O. there in the squadron, I'd been around the squadron for about eight months, uh, mm-hmm. starting to get the hang of things a little bit, mm-hmm. a lot to learn still. Um, and I was about to go out on a flight. Uh, it was January 15, 2014. And one of the more senior J.O.s in the squadron, Basil, came up to me before the flight, and he's like, you know, you've been here eight months, but you just haven't done anything dumb enough yet to earn a call sign. So uh, I think that jinxed me. Uh, Another fun thing that morning, Fisty, uh, another J.O. in the squadron that joined about the same time as I, he, to keep spirits light, he put up on the whiteboard behind the SDO desk a big chart of all the white sharks and tiger sharks and all these big tag sharks that were out swimming around in the ocean. And there happened to be this 16-foot, 3,500 pound white shark named Mary Lee directly underneath the area we're going to be utilizing. So oh, that's like, that's a nice little thing. It'd be yeah. a ter- he said it would be a terrible day to eject because there's a giant white shark that will gobble you right up. And so we, we had a good laugh about that. Got ready for the flight. It was January and it had been a pretty unseasonably cold winter. The water temperature at the buoy was 37 degrees Fahrenheit. Out so the, the water in the ocean where you would be, where the shark would be, essentially. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Uh, so very cold water, mm-hmm. below freezing air temps, so we were wearing dry suits for the day. Yeah. Um, I remember those. So they were very uncomfortable, at least mine was. Did you have your own, or did you have to share one? I was fortunate. I, I had my own, but it was yes. pretty sweaty. It's, it's, <laughs> yes, it's as gross as it sounds, yeah. Uh, Took off the initial part of the flight. We did some air to air refueling. Okay. Everything went smoothly. And we ended up with some extra fuel and some extra time in the airspace. So we set up to do some BFM, as you so know. So, like a dogfighting set against 1v1? 1v1 dogfighting. Um, and it was kind of like stepping into the ring with Mike Tyson. I was fighting uh, my skipper that day. Mm-hmm. So, he'd been doing this for over 15 years. He was a Top Gun graduate, really knew his stuff. Certainly. But. As you know, in the Navy, that's how you train. You, you get your ass kicked. Yep. And we <laughs> and really don't do that much dogfighting uh, before you get to what we call the fleet, you know, to right. the squadron you could be with for a while. Uh, mm-hmm. And so that's really where I think you kind of really start to mix it up with people that are kind of off the playbook, so to speak, you okay. know, like just the... No script. Exactly. Just figuring it out. Mm-hmm. Um, so I was excited. That was one of my favorite things to do in the Super Hornet, you know. Fight. It's probably what people think is like what fighter pilots do is fight in other aircraft, mm-hmm. and uh, I loved every bit of it. Part art firm, yeah. part uh, part science, but uh, we set up in the area. We did I think three or four sets, and we hit Joker fuel, reset down to bingo, which meant uh, for the audience that we just had 
just enough fuel left for maybe another little practice set of fighting. End of the flight, pretty much. One more End to go. End of the flight. So we're kind of almost uh, transiting our way out as we set up the pads. Uh, Skipper pads. Pose. So we were at 12,500 feet, uh, 450 knots, okay. uh, about a mile of beam. Okay, and, so you're basically yeah. lined up like this, going pretty fast, ready to set up. So those pads are like your, your starting point. Exactly. Cool. Um, and a skipper called three, two, one, fights on. We pitched in at each other. Skipper went down, so I matched him. We came down to the merge. I had just gotten my qualification with the Jehemix helmet, which is, uh, for those watching, it's basically a big bulging visor that allows you to train your weapon systems and see all your flight data wherever you look. Very cool system, but uh, just like any new piece of gear, it takes a little bit of practice to integrate mm -hmm. that so that you're not thinking about the button pushing and, and the, the weight of it on your head. So I, I was still getting a little used to it. I was focused in the merge on uh, trying to get a radar acquisition of my flight lead, potentially get a shot off. Uh, didn't, didn't work out how I'd hoped. I was a little bit distracted at the merge, and I didn't realize the airspeed I had gotten up to. Um, so you kind of had your nose stuck down and you were accelerating more and more as you're approaching that merge. And just the few seconds from when we started a mile of beam to when we pitched in, uh, the jet rapidly accelerated beyond what I had expected. And I was already about 30 degrees nose low and partially inverted at the merge. So I opted to continue to roll inverted and mm -hmm. pull the aircraft down in a split ass maneuver, which is a dive down towards the ocean. And as I executed that, I got to about bullseye nose low, so pointed straight down, and a feature on the aircraft called the G-Bucket kicked in, which was designed to prevent uh, mild overstress of the wings when you're in the transonic flight region, so about to break the sound so barrier. So you're so fast, you were already creeping up on the sound barrier at this point. I was. Point. So was this like 650-ish knots at this point in the vicinity? Um, or? Nearby, yeah. Yeah, okay. And, uh, wow. And as that kicked in, the aircraft went from pulling a nice crisp seven and a half Gs, and I could feel that weight. Mm -hmm. Say my head and my helmet weigh approximately 20 pounds. Multiply that by almost eight, so I have almost 160 pounds on my head. As you know, you feel like you can feel that crushing it's an adult. weight. All right, uh, and I'm looking around, and I can feel that. And all of a sudden, I'm looking outside, keeping an eye on my uh, adversary, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, the jet just eased up. I could feel it settle, mm. which was, you know, the worst feeling uh, at this point because I'm pointed straight at the ocean. My reaction was I pulled the throttle to idle. I put out the speed brake, and it was too little too late. And just a couple seconds later, I was pointed 51 degrees nose low, going 695 miles per hour, 0.95 Mach. Um, and I pulled the ejection handle two seconds before I impacted the ocean. Oh um, the ground rush of the ocean coming up me was just so overwhelming that it was my only chance. So uh, I assumed the position, pulled the ejection handle. A normal ejection, people get injured, people uh, have their spines compressed, people get flail injuries. Uh, this was the fastest survived ejection in the history of the Navy. So oh my gosh. Um, coming out at that speed was like hitting a wall with my body. Um, yeah. It was essentially 10 times the force, well, 10 times uh, at almost 700 miles per hour of like a uh, Cat 1 hurricane hitting my body. So just extreme wind wow. force. If you ever stuck your arm out a car window going 70 miles per hour down the highway, you felt that force acting on your arm and that force of parasitic drag is exponentially stronger. So it would have been 100 times that force at 700 miles per hour. And coming out into that, it, uh, in a split second, it had ripped my helmet off, smashed my head, I broke my neck, my left shoulder, both my upper arms, my left forearm in multiple places. This humerus bone ripped through my brachial artery. I did a variety of different nerve damage to my upper body, my forearm. My steel toe boots on my legs were flailing around so violently that they bashed open my tib fibs and my lower leg, so I had open leg fractures. Uh, my Are they lower still on your foot? Oh, they were. Wow. There's some sturdy boots. <laughs> wow, that's horrifying. Uh, but uh, so I was pretty bashed up. The parachute opened just long enough to keep me from dying on impact with the ocean. Mm -hmm. And then I plunged into that icy cold water. Were I you ejected. awake? 
Still? I was in and out of consciousness, and I have a lot of retrograde amnesia from it, mm -hmm. so I only can remember bits and pieces, but we've been able to recreate everything that happened through all the investigation that went into it, mm -hmm. the flight data recorder, the on-scene commanders that were there with the rescue effort, the SAR swimmer, everything I've been able to re uh, re uh, rebuild what You're happened Yeah, the day. story, but man, I, just, I can't imagine just the experience of hitting that wall coming out of the jet. I mean... Golly, just being conscious and awake for that, I can't even imagine. Um, yeah, sorry, please continue. Um, so I don't, I don't remember actually impacting the air. Mm -hmm. I remember pulling the ejection handle, mm -hmm. and then after that, things yeah. are in and out yeah. quite a bit. Yeah. Um, but uh, got just enough of the parachute to open that it kept me from impacting the water so hard that I died. Mm -hmm. uh, and then very quickly, that parachute that had just saved my life sunk underneath the ocean current yeah. and was beginning to pull me under. And yep. This is out, out in the Atlantic Ocean in January and it fairly rough seas. And uh, I started to basically be drowned alive. And if you've ever been held underwater when you desperately need a breath of air, you know that awful feeling. Uh, I was inhaling a lot of salt water. Um, fortunately, my LPU inflated. So a little life preserver around my neck mm -hmm. gave me enough buoyancy that on occasion it would bob me to the surface so I could get a gulp of you air. You couldn't swim. I mean, your arms are destroyed at this point. Completely unusable, yeah. both my arms and my legs. Um, the seawars, which is in our riser that connects to the parachute uh, from our harness, mm -hmm. the, the way that's supposed to work, as you know, is uh, when it gets into salt water, it sets off a little explosive device, and that disconnects your parachute for you because upper body injuries yep. are so common in high-speed ejections. Or unconscious. Um, or unconscious. Uh, unfortunately, one SeaWars fired but didn't disconnect. Hmm. The other SeaWars didn't even fire whatsoever, so my parachute remained connected to me. No ability to disconnect, mm -hmm. uh, so it just took me for a ride. Yep. Um, fortunately, uh, my flight lead saw my... Uh, parachute open. He dropped a mark on my position, coordinated on-scene commander awesome. on the fumes that he had remaining in his fuel. Uh, he got some other aircraft on scene uh, and he spotted, before he flew back to Oceana, he spotted a uh, fishing vessel that was about a mile from the position I was at. And he turned up maritime guard at button 16 and the aircraft tried to get him. Uh, no response. And so he got down really low and really fast and he thumped their bow. So imagine a freaking super hornet flying over your boat at low level wow. and got their attention. They switched up to maritime guard and he was able to guide them over my position past the lat long I was at. That's incredible. And so the fishing vessel was the first uh, craft to show up. They threw out a rope to me, but I was so, um, so beat up and my arms were so unusable, I wasn't able to, I wasn't able to grab it. Ended up just getting tangled in things and... Uh, but at least that boat gave a visual reference for yeah. I, where I was approximately. Because otherwise, I mean, I was just a little tiny dark head bobbing around, mm -hmm. and I was getting pulled under. So, Because um, it's just this big parachute, and all this water is filling up, and that's why those explosives are there, to remove it so you don't get pulled down. I mean, this is a, it's a, pretty, it's a pretty known thing. It's a, it's a shame the equipment didn't work. Was the, was the water so much that, it, so, I mean, gosh, you were underwater too. So I was going to ask how big the waves were, but it really didn't matter, you know, because you were coming down underneath them regardless, huh? Yeah, I would, I would estimate that they were in the four foot range, but, you know, it was pretty disorganized and choppy out in the middle of the ocean. So it was just kind of like being in a washing machine. Yeah. Um, the uh, beacon didn't function either. So fortunately, my skipper was quick. Uh, quick to think of getting this boat over there. Otherwise, I think I don't. I don't think I would have made it. Yeah. Um, I had ejected so fast that my dry suit had shredded open. So, if you've ever felt 37 degree water, it, it just it's like gives you brain freeze and it feels like needles going into your skin. It's so cold. But uh, that cold water was actually helping to keep me from bleeding out so rapidly. Interesting. Uh, and in my mind, you know, I'm just getting drug underwater, uh, inhaling a lot of water. And thinking any minute Mary Lee's just going to come up and finish me off. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it was, you know, it was like worst case scenario. But uh, I hung in there and I was able to get up and get a breath of air occasionally, uh, enough to stay alive. Um, Did you know your skipper was flying around trying to, to help you out? Or no, was, you just kinda I was, like I was in own. pure just survival mode. Yeah. Um, just completely overwhelmed by being yeah, drugged underwater. Um, but uh, eventually... 
uh, an H-60 from a nearby aircraft carrier showed up. They had been instructed to bring me back to the aircraft carrier, not realizing the extent of my injuries. Mm. Their rescue swimmer jumped in thinking I was on the fishing vessel still and uh, didn't get me. Still? You never you were never on the fishing vessel. I wasn't, yeah. but there was, just a, uh, I mean, there was a has rep just on the rescue effort because there were so many different aircraft and vessels and different frequencies, mm. uh, and nobody seemed to be on the same page with the chaos of what was going down. So that, uh, the first rescue swimmer swam past my position. Fortunately, another H-60 had showed up, um, and they saw the other rescue swimmer going to the boat, and fortunately, the pilot of that helicopter spotted my little dark head as I had come to the surface. Uh -huh. And so they got over to my position. Their rescue swimmer, Cheech, uh, the week prior, a Navy H-53 Sea Dragon had gone down in almost the same exact area. And the policy at the time for the Navy was anyone involved in an aircraft accident, you're supposed to put on a backboard to lift them up into the helicopter in case they have a spinal injury, um, which was good, a good thought, but it took so long for them to get the crew out of the water with that technique mm -hmm. that uh, some of the crew members perished from hypothermia before they could ever get to the hospital. And that was just a week earlier? And so Cheech is coming off like the worst week of his the life. Same rescue diver. Same, same rescue swimmer. Uh, and he learned those lessons, though, from that. And he said, I'm not going to bother with the backboard. He jumped in. He got down to my position. He hooked into my titanium D-ring to keep, uh, keep hold of me. Mm -hmm. And he said the force of that parachute just drug us underwater. And for me, you know, that it was oh, just... Oh, it drug this, him as well under. It drug wow. him as a, a rescue swimmer. He yeah. couldn't fight the force of that parachute pulling both mm -hmm. of us. Um, and you know, that was a terrifying feeling. And even for him, he had, he had been in the pool doing rescues and getting drug under when he could see the bottom of the pool. But he said when he was able to see just this dark blue abyss below us and that all the paracord tangled, he, you know, he said it was pretty overwhelming, but his training kicked in. He, uh, he was able to cut me free of all the paracord and quickly got me up into the helicopter riding up the helicopter line, we were just spinning around, we we're getting wow. blasted with prop wash. And then they got me into the helicopter and headed towards Norfolk General, which had a level one trauma unit. Uh, and on the ride there, they said I was in and out of consciousness the whole way. They were fighting to keep me alive, uh, doing sternum rubs and everything they could to keep me with them. Uh, I was dangerously cold from hypothermia. Uh, they got me to Norfolk General put me on a gurney. Uh, I was conscious, sitting up, trying to get up and, and move around. And uh, I was so out of it at that point, I was just screaming, help, help, help. Uh -huh. And uh, they got me into the hospital. They treated me for severe hypothermia, my core body temperature. By the time I got to the hospital, I was already warmed up in the helicopter for the 45-ish minute ride mm -hmm. that it took uh, to get there, and my core body temp when I got to the hospital was 87 degrees Fahrenheit, which is at 86 Fahrenheit, you're supposed to be just a goner for sure. But that hypothermia actually kept me from bleeding to death. They said had my dry suit functioned properly, I would have perished way before anybody even showed up. So Incredible. A wild twist. Uh, I was treated for organ failure. My kidneys were just so overwhelmed with all the trauma and the proteins and everything were breaking down and my muscles that... Um, I had to be put on dialysis and have blood transfusions. I had lost a lot of blood. Um, they treated me with a bear hugger to warm my body, uh, had me on fluids, all the stuff going on to try to get me stable enough so they could take me to surgery. Uh, once stable enough, they brought me in and uh, induced a coma. And I spent the next week in an induced coma as I underwent over a dozen surgeries. Uh, they... Fortunately, had the surgical dream team on uh, the day I showed up. Some oh. of the best surgeons in the country were all working together that same day. Incredible. And uh, they were able to put Humpty Dumpty together again. <laughs> uh, they, uh, they put, uh, first they did fasciotomies on all my extremities, which is opening up the compartments of the muscles uh, to prevent them from constricting the blood flow. There was so much trauma and swelling that the swelling was cutting off the circulation to all my extremities. And historically, um, that would be when you would amputate a person's limb mm -hmm. because the damage is so bad. But with this uh, fasciotomy procedure, they're able to open those compartments up and relieve the pressure and help blood to start circulating again. Um, wow. 
I had that on all four extremities. Uh, they rebuilt my skeleton with titanium rods, uh, screws, steel plates. Um, I've seen the movie about this, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wolverine. Wolverine. Yeah, yeah. So that's what my X-ray looks like. <laughs> that's why the beard. I get it now. It's all yeah. making sense. Uh, and uh, so they put me back together after a week in that induced coma and all those surgeries. Uh, there was a lot of doubt that I was going to come to. Uh, people, you know, my mom and dad are there. A lot of my squadron mates are all sitting around in the waiting room. Oh. And uh, someone, uh, Basil, I think, uh, was the guy who's like. Ah, he's a scrappy motherfucker. He'll be fine. <laughs> and uh, they took scrappy motherfucker and they shortened it to Smurf. Uh, and the politically correct cover story for my call sign is uh, I'm a short guy that turned blue from hypothermia. <laughs> but uh, now you know the true story. Uh, Very cool anyways, call sign. Uh, well earned as well. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, man, let's just stop for a minute. So, one, you probably wouldn't even be alive right now if that rescue swimmer perhaps not just a week earlier, learned some very valuable lessons. And I can't even imagine how motivated he must have been to get you back on that helicopter once you got down there. Man, he, have you uh, spoken with him? I have. The, uh, the whole, well, most of the rescue crew that was in that helicopter showed up at the hospital awesome. um, once I was conscious again. Um, but I, I still keep in touch with Cheech and some of the crew. Yeah. And, uh, you know, every time I talk to him, I'm like, man, I owe you my life. No, um, no. He's actually a, a sniper now in the army. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. All right, switching he's, it up. I think he's deployed right now, too. But, yeah. uh, well, I don't know if you know this, but uh, one of my squadron mates in, in VFA 11, and this was uh, at the time that this was going down. I remember when you ejected. Um, my wife remembers it. Most spouses probably in the area do because when something like that happens, uh, a jet goes down. It's happened multiple times while I was out there. Um, Essentially, all the spouses are waiting to hear something, but it's a policy within the Navy not to uh, allow people to essentially reach out and communicate to their uh, spouses that they're okay because the last thing we want to do is have, um, you know, the one spouse without a phone call right. wondering what's going on. So it's not the way we want to do things. Um, in, in, in this case, you know, with... with um, all the people there, was your family able to kind of get that information um, in a comfortable way or did the system work in that manner? Uh, I think largely it was comfortable for my family. Um, my skipper called and my mom answered the phone and he's like, uh, I, I think he said something like he, he fell out of the aircraft trying to explain to my mom in a way she'd maybe understand. Hmm. So my mom was like, oh, he fell out of the aircraft and he's in the hospital? And in her head, the way she interpreted it was, I was like climbing up the ladder getting in for a flight and I like fell off onto the tarmac. Uh, and so it was probably a good thing that that's what she thought as she was flying out to see me with, uh, uh, with my dad because once she got there and then realized how injured I was, I think it was pretty hard for her. Um, but kind of a funny story of how she found out in a way. Um, but yeah, they, my family, my squadron mates, uh, we're all just standing by hoping I'd come out of it. And uh, another week went by. I wasn't in an induced coma anymore. Okay. Uh, they were trying to get me out, but I just was completely out. And after two weeks, the lights just started to come back on. I remember just darkness and being able to hear familiar voices. And I opened my eyes, and there's this room filled with my friends and family and uh you know, I largely recognized everybody, but I was completely confused of where I was at, and mm -hmm. I had no recollection of what had happened at no that memory. point. No memory. And, uh, you know, the doctors came in and the staff, and they wanted to just kind of tell it to me straight, I think. And they're like, listen, here's what's happened. Uh, you're likely never going to walk again. You're never going to use your arms again, and your flying career is over. And something inside me was like, I'm just going to prove you guys wrong. Um, already at that point, huh? Yeah. There you was just this fire off. like, okay, you want to tell me I can't do something? That just makes me want to do it even more. Yeah. And uh, so I, I was in a, in a gurney. Uh, they had already taken out the ventilator. Uh, and my whole body was wrapped in this plastic wrap. And all the fasciotomies were stitched and stapled up. And I just had, I was covered in stitches and staples. Uh -huh. I remember trying to move and I thought 
the wool blanket over my body was made out of lead or it was tied down because I couldn't budge it, but it was because I was paralyzed. just thought you weren't strong enough. Yeah. Wow. I was just so weak. Incredible. Um, and I spent the next two weeks uh, transitioning to the ICU step down, uh, slowly was able to like start scooting around on the bed. Um, I got stable enough, they were able to transport me to Richmond VA Poly Trauma Center in Richmond, Virginia, okay. uh, at the VA hospital there. And I started undergoing every kind of therapy out there, basically. Uh, I was doing speech therapy, vision therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, kinesiotherapy, recreational therapy. Was it just like a full-time job? It was. Wow. Basically every day, all day was just, just relearning how to do everything. Um, between the drugs and the head injury, I was really out of it. Um, I was easily confused. Like I couldn't find my way around on my own. I was, I was still in a wheelchair getting wheeled around mm -hmm. by people. Were there more surgeries at this point or were you finished up? Um, at that moment, I was done mm -hmm. for a little bit. Um, I, I eventually did have more surgeries, but uh, that was largely the, the rehabilitation I did there was yeah. largely therapy-based. And I addressed every day was just kind of like, what can I do today? I can't walk. I can't use my arms. I can't remember my way back to my room, but like maybe I can give it my all. And so every therapy session, whatever it was, I just like, poured my soul into it. And little by little, I started to regain a little function, um, relearned how to walk on a walker. Uh, my arm still didn't work. And eventually my pinky and my ring finger on my left hand started to work. Hmm, and so I, re first one. I relearned how to brush my teeth, how to do everything with oh. those two fingers. And then one day this hand just started kind of tingling and little by little it came back. So um, you're moving your hands pretty good right now. What, how long ago is, is, is this period in your life right now? It's been uh, nine years now, oh, almost wow. nine years. Incredible. Um, I, had, I, had, I was very fortunate to receive a lot of good treatment and care. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, anyways, I eventually got to the point I could walk around on a, on a walker. I started to be able to do things with my hands again. And I was transferred. Uh, I got to go back to Virginia Beach and do outpatient therapy. Uh, back to where you, where you came from. Right. Did you move back to your old house at this point? Is this your first time kind of going back home in a sense? It was. And, and so my squadron mate, Fisty, uh, and my friend, Vinny, they took me in. And uh, I started living with those guys as I did all this rehabilitation. Awesome. Um, I did another surgery that went terribly wrong mm -hmm. uh, at Naval Hospital Portsmouth. How so? Um, the surgery itself went well, but they ended up, after the surgery, I think they thought somebody was coming to pick me up, who, and there wasn't anybody coming to pick me up. In my hospital gown, still just coming out of anesthesia, they wheeled me in a wheelchair down to the lobby to like the exit to have somebody get me. And as I came to out of the anesthesia, I was... <laughs> You know, my ass is hanging out the back of <laughs> the wheelchair and there's nobody around. And I'm like, what's going on? Eventually, a nurse came up and go, and it was like, uh, is somebody picking you up? And I was like, I don't think so. Unbelievable. And she was visibly like, I can't believe somebody would just leave you here. That's incredible. Yes, I can't um, believe it either. They took me back to a room and there was just like a graveyard crew. Um, and they had, I think they had called in these two staff members to basically take care of me. One was a brand new corpsman. Uh, who I think must have just gotten out of training, who mm -hmm. had no idea what he was doing and was in way over his head, mm -hmm. and an instant nurse who also had no idea what was going on. Mm -hmm. um, they put in a, a new IV port, and instead of hitting a vein, it went under and sub -cued, and so that fluid, instead of getting into my system, was just swelling up like a water balloon on my forearm. Oh, my goodness. And I kept telling him, hey, I think this is sub -cued. At that point, I was very familiar with uh, IVs. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're like, oh, no, it's okay. It looks fine. And I think they just didn't know. So this is, a, this is a, explain this hospital again that you're at. I mean, it seems this is, like. This is Naval Hospital Portsmouth, wow. which is actually one of the main training hospitals for the Navy. And so they do a lot of training, but this day in particular, they didn't seem to be anybody with any oversight of what was going on. I wouldn't on. think your case would be one that you'd want to train on. <sighs> yeah, I really wish uh, there was <laughs> some, a grown up in the room mm -hmm. uh, there, but uh as the time went on, I was getting very dehydrated. Um, the anesthesia was wearing off. 
and I started to feel the pain from the surgery, which was relatively minor. Mm -hmm. But when it started to get really bad, I was starting to go through withdrawals from this cornucopia of different pharmaceutical sure. medications yeah. I was on at that point. I was on gabapentin at 2,400 milligrams a day, so very high doses of the nerve pain medication, mm -hmm. oxycodone, oxycontin, amitriptyline, tramadol, trazodone, and the list goes on, and all the medications I had to take to counteract the side effects of those. And I basically, as I'm stuck in this room, had gone cold turkey off all of those at once and started to suffer the withdrawal symptoms. It was just a normal thing though, right? Or were you supposed to be getting I was supposed to be getting my medication, but uh, the two folks in charge of taking care of me didn't know how to get to the pharmacy, didn't know what to get me. I was explaining my dosage and everything I needed and said, hey, there's a pharmacy one floor below us. You guys can go there. But they just, they didn't know what to do. Um, and so That's incredible. at this point, uh, they had me try to pee into a urinal. And when I went in the urinal eventually, uh, after a lot of straining, it was like a dark brown liquid that came out. So I was in severe dehydration, probably kidney failure, and just miserable. And it was just getting worse and worse and worse. And they said, okay, well, if you want to be able to go home, we need you to be able to walk down to the end of the hallway on your walker to demonstrate that you can be mobile. So I had just been out of surgery a few hours ago, but I wanted to get the hell out of there. And so I grabbed the walker, and with what little strength I had left, I remember standing up, and I could hear crunching mm. in my leg uh, of probably that titanium rod settling, settling in there. In, yeah. And it was very painful, but what was worse was the combination of the dehydration making me extremely nauseous and then all the withdrawals hitting me. Um, but I hobbled my way down to the end of this hallway. And when I got to the end of the hallway, I stumbled into a room, which I think was a, a physical therapy clinic. And there were a couple, I think one guy was a physical therapist and then maybe a physical therapist assistant were in there. And they were like, what is this guy doing in there? And by the time I got in there, I had collapsed onto the chair and I was dry heaving into a, into a garbage can. And they're like, what is going on? Um, I think they called one of my friends, uh, Amanda Johnson, who is a physical therapist. Um, and she ended up coming in with her husband, uh, Luke Smuggler, who was in my squadron as a department head. Mm. And they were there witnessing me go through just awful withdrawals. I was screaming. I was yelling as those waves of pain and misery would hit me. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many hours had gone by, but eventually a doctor showed up and they put me on a patient controlled uh, drip of Dilaudid. And so by hitting that little button, it gave me mm -hmm. some relief. Uh, no, I mean, were you, were you kind of like fully aware of how shitty your situation was at this point or was oh, it yeah. just kind of yeah I knew it was there was something terribly wrong mm -hmm. and you know Amanda who was very familiar with Portsmouth I think she had worked there pre uh, previously she was appalled by what was going on but uh, eventually they got me my medications um, and the next day I got to leave but it was a pretty miserable experience um once I got back to Virginia Beach, uh, Amanda actually, in her off time when she wasn't working in the physical therapy clinic, kind of took me under her wing and started doing uh, some training with me. She showed up like for the- Like outside of the VA system. Right, outside mm -hmm. of the, the Navy hospital and everything. Mm -hmm. And she showed up the first day of training and she had a Nalgene bottle and it said, patient's tears on the side. <laughs> I had Here a cane at this point. And she's like, I don't want to ever see you walking with that cane again. She like snatched it away. Oh and she proceeded to- basically beat me into shape and I loved every bit of it. You know, I had been an athlete growing up and kind of like that, you know, physical. Well, sure. But you got yeah. iron rods and you're like now, or, you know, titanium <laughs> or what have you. Yeah. Um, was, was that just, was that a struggle every day? I mean, it must've been physically challenging, painful, but also just like the lack of muscle buildup. I mean, oh yeah. Yeah. The, between the, all the nerve atrophy and damage in the, in the surgeries. And, and I was also, my whole body was so messed up from all the medications, uh, being on all these antibiotics that were required for the surgeries had just destroyed my gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. My whole body was out of whack. My hormones were jacked up. Um, I was a mess, but I just kept every day keeping at the training and the therapy. And uh, my friends started taking me out surfing. Like I could barely 
paddle my arms and my buddy uh, Spicoli took me out in Virginia life Beach jacket, just I getting hope. crushed. No life jacket. <laughs> I was wearing a wetsuit, which gave me some buoyancy, but uh, I was Man. getting beat up by the waves and held under and I popped up and I remember just laughing like, this is fun really? again. Really? Didn't um, kind of give you any... No, I was kind of concerned that maybe it would, but um, I really loved it. Uh, that was your first time back in? Yeah, and uh, I got back... Spicoli took me out downhill mountain biking. <laughs> I could barely use my my left hand to use the front brake, and uh, but he got me back out doing stuff. My friends were taking me out, and and That's the so strike important. fighter community was so welcoming of me. Awesome, um, being back and keeping at it. And uh, I had to go through a FENAB, uh, mm -hmm. which is the Field Navy Aviator, Naval Aviator Evaluation Board, because I had just crashed a eighty nine million dollar aircraft mm -hmm. and. Um, that was a, a pretty tough process. They really tear apart your life, but, mm -hmm. uh, it turned in my favor and, uh, they granted me permission to go back and fly super hornets if I could get through, uh, my rehabilitation, which was still a big if at that point. So you're still, you're still healing up, but you've kind of gone through the potential disciplinary process to say, Hey, like it was just something, um, that you did wrong in some sense, or was this an accumulation of, of, you know, bad things that happen. And they were like, hey, you're good to go should you get medically up. Yeah, they, they, you know, it. they looked in and they interviewed everybody in my squadron and they looked at the case of what had happened. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that G bucket has bit many aviators far more experienced than me, yeah. uh, both before and after my ejection. Um, and I also, you know, people in my squadron like me. I was a good pilot. It wasn't like I was... Uh, on the struggle bus before this happened sure. because I think that could have gone very right. different. Yeah, just because that, you know, something bad happened, you go through this process, you would have to go through this process no matter, um, you know, whether everyone thought you saved the day or not. This is just kind of a normal review process. So right. it sounds like the process worked. It did. And did that feel, you know, did that feel like the work that you had put in was leading on the right path or did it just kind of further motivate you to keep going on the physical therapy? I was, or did you have some questions of whether you wanted to get back in the cockpit? I really, I really wanted to get back yeah. on the horse the whole time. That was what, that was like my driving force is I want to get back on the horse and, and, and get back at this. Mm -hmm. I don't want this to be the end of that chapter in my mm -hmm. life. And, um, you know, I went to the, either you do this informal board with some, uh, with a lieutenant and a lieutenant commander who really interview you. And then I went to a formal board where you walk in and it's a boardroom of, aviators on both sides of this big long table wow. i was dressed in my summer whites and uh the admiral came in and he sat down everybody sit down and he just he did, the only question he asked me was lieutenant gill are you fearless and i said sir i don't remember a lot from the ejection but i'm certain what little cushion there is on the ejection seat was puckered up inside me real good when that happened <laughs> he didn't smile he didn't say oh, anything. Oh, didn't even crack a grin, huh? He just wow. got up and walked out of the room. <laughs> and then... Uh, what well, were you thinking news. at that point? Were you like, I was like, oh, I don't shit, know if that went well. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it ended up going well. Yeah. And uh, he granted me permission to go back and fly, awesome. um, which was more motivation. Um, and after two years of that rehabilitation, I was able to max out the PRT again. I was So the PRT, what's that? So the physical readiness test for the Navy, which is basically uh, you got to do push-ups, sit-ups, and then run a okay. mile and a half. Um, so you're, you're walking around, you're running, you're doing push-ups. Yeah, I, mean, I had gone from hobbling around on a cane to basically being able to outrun nearly everybody in my command. Wow, and, uh, what? that's incredible. And it was just such a huge relief once uh, they gave me the permission to go back to fly. Um, I was actually at the wing recovering uh, What's the wing? So this is the Strike Fighter Wing Atlantic, which uh, is sort of an administrative role at NAS Oceana. Okay. It's a common command for people to go to while you're recovering from injury or if you have issues uh, that take you out of the cockpit temporarily. Got it. Thank you. And so I was doing a variety of ground jobs as I was doing my rehabilitation. Okay. And I got an email uh, from a variety of different people in different fighter squadrons on base. And they were saying that they were spotting uh, these craft out in the working areas. They didn't know what they were, but you know, some of the people were like, we need to load up some AIM 9Xs and go out and shoot these things down. And other people you know, were more concerned with just the safety of flight issue. 
So this is right off the coast of Virginia Beach. This is the same working Correct. areas. This is right that where you I had our experience. Okay. Very uh, interesting. Same time period too, yes? Same time period. Okay. This would have been um, 2015 to 2016. Yep. And uh, so at first I thought maybe people were just pulling my leg and I responded to the email, something like Strike Fighter Wing Atlantic, X Files, Fox Mulder signing off uh, in the email. Classic response. It's and then right. someone came back <laughs> and was like, uh, We need to move this conversation over to Sipper, which is the secure internet. Oh, and, so that uh, happened pretty quick. So I realized, oh, this isn't this isn't a joke. Mm-hmm. Like these aren't just people screwing with me. Uh, and very shortly thereafter, uh, I classed up and started retraining in the F eighteen. And I had been back for a couple months flying, and I was out doing a, um, I can't remember if we were doing a air intercept during the initial phases or if it was during fighter phase, uh, doing more advanced uh, air-to-air presentations. But uh, I was in the wingman position flying out to the area, and as we got out to the area, my flight lead was picking up all these contacts all around the air airspace that we were supposed to have mm-hmm. to us that day. And... I was primarily focused on flying formation, yep. uh, being the wingman and not hitting my lead. Yep. But while I while I could, I was using the radar and I was able to pick one of these up, take an acquisition, and then I trained my FLIR to it. Yep. And it was it was fairly far away. I don't remember the exact range, nor could I probably share that anyways, but it looked just like a sphere. It really? was a very grainy picture. Um, oh, you were on TV mode? Yeah, and, uh, and I think I cycled through some of the uh, IR modes as well. But uh, do you remember if there was any IR energy that came off of it? You know, I don't remember clearly. Mm -hmm. Uh, I did the white hot and the black hot and and I could still see it in Mm -hmm. that mode. Um, And I don't remember which one I could make it out the best. But all I could tell is it was this little sphere out there. Um, And we ended up having to cancel that event that day because there were so many of these out throughout the working areas. Mm -hmm. Um, And when we got back, I logged uh, sharp at the SDO desk, and I can't remember the name of the reporting that you did at the end of SHARP. It might have been part of SHARP. Uh, ASAP? ASAP. Yeah, I and there's, ASAP a, there's a commercial aviation ASAP, but it's not that. Just if, for people listening, mm-hmm. there's a, a, the military has their own program with the same name, and they're not necessarily connected, so and, uh, and so I, I filled out a form with that, largely saying congratulations to our adversaries for discovering a way to disrupt naval aviation training. <laughs> Um, again, not knowing what it was mm-hmm. uh, and, and kind of making light of it. But uh, a lot of other people were seeing these out there and they, mm-hmm. were, they were becoming a safety of a flight issue. Yeah. Um, but uh, Did you ever see one with your own eyes? I never saw one with my own eyes mm-hmm. flying. Um, while I was living in Virginia Beach, I had an encounter uh, during my recovery. Mm-hmm. Um, I was living out uh, on the inlet, kind of in a wooded area with yep. uh, my buddy Fisty and Vinny. And I was up on the second story floor of the house that we were in. And in the middle of the night, one night, I woke up to use the restroom. And there was a bright light coming in through the window. Hmm. And it looked like maybe somebody was out in the parking or out in the driveway with their brights on. So I looked out the window and up above, way off the ground, was what looked like a set of stadium lights. It was maybe eight circular lights by five or six circular lights in a rectangular pattern was sitting right outside the window, just shining in on me. Like above the tree line? It was below the trees. It looked like it was very close to the house. Really? Um, And I just got this overwhelming sense of everything was okay. I don't think I even went to the restroom. I just got back in my bed and fell asleep. Wow. And I woke up the next morning and I kept wondering, was that a dream? But it was so crisp in my memory and remains in my memory that way that I don't think it was a dream because I feel a lot of my dreams will fade over time, mm-hmm. whereas this is something that was so vivid, um, it really stuck with wow, me. That's yeah. interesting. You don't remember anything else, I assume. Yeah. No. Or no. Is, that, is that the only time that's occurred? That was the only time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you, what did that, you know, did you, what do you take away from that? You know, I mean, do, do you feel like, that was some type of experience with with this unknown phenomenon. Do you do you feel like there's room for some other explanation in there? How I don't do you know how do you grapple was. with that? I don't know what it was. Mm-hmm. Um, it the overwhelming sense I had from it was it was something very positive and something caring that wasn't there hostile mm-hmm. uh, as a hostile uh, or hostile intent. 
Um, but I, I, I have no idea what it is. I don't, I don't know if it's our technology, if it's uh, alien technology, if it's transdimensional, if it's, I don't know what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, it was uh, pretty exciting to, to have that experience wow. and, and see that. And, um, and now meeting you guys with a lot of similar experiences. Um, yeah, and so it's been eye opening. Yeah, not just you know we've been interviewing a number of pilots, and we were all fortunate enough to hang out before we're taping this. Uh, and it's incredible to just listen to the stories everyone telling about um, just how common this is, and and how everyone has uh, different experiences with this that are all you know seem somewhat similar, although different. It's you know I, I encourage other people that have these experiences to you know reach out and to have these conversations because I think it's a lot more common. Than, than we realize. And it seems to be on the increase uh, of people seeing this sort of phenomenon. That's what we're seeing. You know, we spoke with uh, a commercial pilot yesterday who has been tracking this for about the last eight months, and there has been an, a, a market increase, not only in his uh, perception, but basically the general air crew that he's been talking with. Um, we've been, uh, I've been, I've been reached out to by a number of these pilots, and I've been communicating with them and they've expressed to me that, hey, we're all talking about this in the air now. We're, we're looking around. We're not afraid to necessarily talk about it amongst the pilots to some degree. Um, but whether they were talking about it or not before, they were definitely looking up, right? Um, these guys have 30,000 plus hours and you know they know the difference between a, a satellite and right. an aircraft. And So yeah, so funny story, uh, if you will. There's a, uh, a gentleman that was in the squadron with me. Uh, he was a JO, junior officer, about maybe like four to six months ahead of me. Um, and his wife was a helicopter pilot. And she was on a, uh, a flight, or she was on duty, and she was called to go rescue um, the helicopter that went down. She was on that flight as well. Um, diver went in. And then, and just as you said, you know, they learned some lessons. Um, and then when your ejection occurred, uh, my buddy's wife was on the helicopter that went out and picked you up as well. So uh, as you know, it's a very small community. So I'm, I'm really happy to see that everyone was able to support you, you know, throughout the air wing during your recovery. And The support just, was massive. Yeah. Um, she might have been the one that spotted me even. Um, Potentially. I know, I know one of the pilots spotted me. Oh, really? That was the first. That's how they got it. Wow, that's incredible. <laughs> there's, a, um, there's a strange thing that happens with, you know, emergencies in the Navy. Um, the spouses really go through quite the stress when um, there is an accident because they kind of have to wait for the process to evolve. And it's usually no one's communicating to their spouses so that no one is left behind. Um, there was a, an incredible... Uh, incident that occurred in Virginia Beach uh, during the time, you know, I believe you were there when it occurred, um, I believe it was in 2014, but I'll have to check that date. Uh, a squadron mate of mine, uh, we were in training at this point, we were in the RAG at 106, and we went to take off to do a air-to-air training um, mission. And it was a RAG, so it was pretty basic, just two V2 coming at each other. And uh, two aircraft took off, the ones we were going to uh, simulate our battle against, and then I took off, and then there was one aircraft that was intending to come after us, my wingman, essentially. And so we went out to the area, and the other aircraft never showed up. Um, we didn't really think much of it. That happens often. The aircraft will break, or a generator will go down, or a million other things, as you know. And um, so no big deal. Um, I made it in... So we did our set. We did the best we could with the three aircraft, and then uh, we checked out of the area. And instead of routing us back to NAS Oceana, they were routed us to NAS um, Norfolk, to the north, which is um, it's a um, base where there's some big wing aircraft and there's, it's where all the ships dock and whatnot. Common divert out of Oceana. Exactly. Something's it, going on at Oceana. Right? Exactly. So, you know, God, I was such an idiot. And we were flying back and I made some stupid joke to my instructor. I was like, well, I don't see any smoke, so at least they didn't crash. <laughs> uh, I guess I just wasn't looking in the right spot. So uh, we went back to Norfolk, parked the jet and uh, walked inside the FBO and there was a bunch of other F-18s there and that's when we knew something was you know, not great. And um, 
we saw on the TV, we saw, of course, now the smoke and, and whatnot. So good job, Ryan. But um, there was an entire apartment building, I believe it was four or five stories that was engulfed in flames. And at first I didn't know that it was a jet crash. I just saw all the fire and I didn't, couldn't even see any parts because the jet was just gone for the most part. Um, and, you know, we're like, oh boy, you know, and we end up seeing at some point that it was 106. And of course, people, everyone's checking the, the schedule. And it turns out it was the guys, you know, our wingman that was going to join us on that mission. Um, a crazy story. They took off and they had um, essentially what was the result of one engine failure compounded with a problem with the other, other engine at the same time. Couldn't hold the altitude. Um, and the, it was a Delta, right? It was one of the I believe it was, yep. Sort of uh, underpowered two-seat legacy Hornets. Um, yep, they are. Um, there's, you know, a great debate within naval aviation about, you know, should they put the gear up? Should they put it down? Can they maintain level? You know, there's so many Monday morning quarterbacks that go on with that. In fact, at the time, they actually had us try to fly in the sim after it happened to see what we would do and, and you know, how far we could make it and if we could have maintain what we call wings level. Without it was defending. a really common uh, occurrence in EP sims <laughs> yeah. after that. Yeah, They would That's always right. throw that one that. at us. Yeah. So, you know, they actually ended up, they were able to punch their centerline tank off before they ejected. Uh, I believe it hit the highway. So there's NAS Oceana and then there's the ocean over here. And you essentially just take off and then fly right over the ocean. But there's a highway in between that. And they were coming down over the highway and they punched the tank off and it fell onto the road, didn't hit anyone as far as I know. So like miracle number one, as they say, right. uh, full tank of gas. Um, and then they punched out, I think it was like 40 or 60 feet when the weapon system officer in the back actually pulled the handle. And that's way, way too low. Uh, I mean, you essentially have to be wings level, um, but their, their shoots I don't think really inflated at all, but the weapon system officer in the back goes out first uh, and his chute mostly inflated and he came down and he was like conscious and whatnot. Uh, the pilot who was basically just trying to fly all the way down and he, you know, I even talked to him. He's like, I probably would have just, I would have flown that right into the dirt. You know, like I wouldn't have ejected. I would have been trying to save that the whole time. It just never occurred to him, you know, and the, the instructor in the back, the weapon system officer, basically wanted to just save his life by punching out. He, he doesn't remember uh, punching out. Um, it was probably about 40 feet for him and like 60 feet for the back seater. Um, his parachute got snagged in a tree. He, so he just woke up dangling in a tree next to a burning apartment building. And his first thought was, I just, I just killed maybe 100, 150 people. Um, he was mortified. I, I remember seeing the, the, the pictures where they were just like in tears, just confused at the, at the scene, you know. I, I mean, I can't imagine flying an aircraft like that. And you're just, you know, you're in the zone. You're in complete control of everything, you know, up until the moment you're not, and you're not expecting it. And it must be just an incredible shock to just go off for a flight with your buddies and literally seconds later you're waking up in someone's lawn, potentially, you know, next to a burning building. I mean, thank God your ejection at least as, and it might have saved your life, but at least it was over water. You only had to worry about your own aircraft. Right. Um, your own, you know, your own damage, if you will. Um, and this was actually occurring on uh, Good Friday, uh, believe it or not, when this happened. Um, but for whatever reason, on that day, uh, every single person was out of that building, except for one person's cat. And that was the only fatality of that crash. It's almost unbelievable. But yeah, pretty incredible. So. Yeah. Um, after he had recovered from his injuries, uh, he was in my, my first class going through VFA 106. Hmm. So I became friends with the pilot. Yeah. I flew with that Wizzo as an instructor. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, pretty incredible that... No one was harmed in that. I mean, he, he took some, some injuries for sure, but yep. he's back, uh, back to the fleet. And he was, in a fact. successful uh, Yeah, he career. went to the fleet, and he ended up in uh, Meridian, Mississippi as an instructor pilot at the same time I was there. So um, essentially we went out for a flight together, and he ended up punching out, and I didn't see him again for uh, seven years or so when we both ended up as instructor pilots in Meridian. It's like, oh, hey, dude. Glad to <laughs> see you Remember that day? <laughs> Welcome back. So, yeah, just crazy job. Yeah. Comes with the territory, I guess. Yep. Uh, and it, you kind of put it behind, in the back of your mind, you know, that something like that could happen to you. Mm -hmm. Compartmentalize that. 
You have to. But you then, can't fly scared like that. You know, sometimes it comes up and gets right in your face and a reminder how serious that job is. And Did you have any sense of just, like, how the how fast it all happened? Like, like that transition from, like, in control to... What was really was the next a, thought? I mean, did were you waking up and there was confusion or, or was it fear as you went through the process in a sense? So um, my memory is spotty throughout, mm -hmm. but I vividly remember the sinking feeling in my stomach as I felt the G-force ease off of me. And so it, once once you ejected and you're like... It, no, as, as I'm in this dive, bullseye nose low, yeah. and that G limiter function kicks in from the G bucket mm -hmm. as I hit the transonic flight regime, right before I break that the speed negative. of sound, I could feel that ease in the pull, and that was a terrifying feeling. Mm -hmm. To be pointed and have the stick all the way in my lap, commanding this thing to turn as hard as it can, and now it's not. And in the few seconds that I had between then and when I punched out, it was just this overwhelming feel of discomfort and tear. And oh. I remember the rush of the ocean coming up at me and just being like, oh my God. But I responded appropriately and it was, I managed to just pull the ejection handle. Mm -hmm. But it was, I mean, there was no other option at the point uh, I had reached. Uh, do you ever dream about that? I do. Yeah. Um, for a long time, I've dealt with sleep issues related to flashbacks and night tears with it. Um, I get little clips of being in the ocean and the emotions I was experiencing as I was being drowned alive. The fear of the shark uh -huh. that was I knew was in the you water. Really did, you were feel, f fearing that at the time. That was like an emotion that came through, a thought that came through. It was through, just like, absolute you know. dread um, oh my God. in the pit of my stomach that, that I'm not coming out of this. I mean between just my body just being completely useless, the the sting of the ocean and the brain freeze and just... How did you even um, breathe? I mean, I understand you're going to the water on your body. I mean, like, is every breath like a struggle to stay alive? Or did you get yeah. into like this pattern where you're like, I could do this for a bit? I mean, you know, I, I have it in, in such little clips of that memory. I don't I don't recall exactly if I had gotten into a pattern, but I have vivid memories of that feeling of inhaling salt water while being underwater with oh. not thinking I was going to get another breath. That was it. Getting to the surface and coughing and getting a sip of air and then being pulled right back under. Um, I had this great fear that I knew I was injured and likely bleeding. And, you know, there's all the talk of, you know, sharks, sharks. they smell your blood. Oh. I learned after the fact that sharks actually are very repelled by the smell of human blood. Where They'll smell of fish blood, and yeah, uh, but they smell our blood, and it's like uh, the slop at, you know, in the chow hall when someone reheated some old lentil <laughs> soup or something, and the shark's like, nah, I'm not that hungry. What about your dye pack? So we, we fly with this, this pack that should open up, and then it leaves this colorful stream in the water so that people can help rescue did that go off at all? It's, uh, a lot of the gear was, I ejected so fast, a lot of that gear shredded off my vest mm. in the initial ejection and went who knows where. I don't know for certain if that dye pack was still attached to me when I went in the ocean and if it deployed, but uh, I was in the water long enough. If it did deploy on its own, because I had no ability to activate yeah. it, um, if it somehow managed to activate itself, um, by the time anybody saw me, there was there was no die, so that likely had dissipated if it was there at all. Did you do you did you expect to actually get rescued? I mean, was that the expectation? I mean, I was so in and out of it. I just, just yeah. I was just focused on getting a breath of air, and that's it. Just and and I think I got to a point in where my brain just shut down, and I have this retrograde amnesia, which is where my brain is protecting me from these extremely traumatic memories. And while I get little clips of them, I don't have a linear memory from like the ejection all the way through being picked up. Just these little snapshots in remembering those emotions and uh, wow. the tear um, of it. And then by the time they picked me up though, I was just so out of it. Um, I must have been in shock and, and severely hypothermic and a lot of blood loss And at that point. My consciousness is just uh, the tapes were off, you know, yeah. which is probably a good thing. Um, 
there's a chance that as time goes on, some of these memories may continue to come up. Um, Do you want them to? And part of me is frustrated that I can't remember everything, um, but at the same time, knowing the emotions that have come with some of the clips that I have gotten, I'm, I'm kind of happy that maybe, maybe that stuff can just stay buried somewhere in my mind and yeah. uh, not surface. So, you know, the brain's very sensitive. Your body would beat the shit. Uh, I have to assume, you know, we talk about memory and all that. We want to talk about perhaps, you know, your, your mental recovery as well and, and perhaps the damage. Sure. Yeah. Um, I was, you know, they, they sent me down to NAMI in Pensacola. I had to speak to multiple psychologists. What's NAMI? Uh, NAMI is basic, I forget what the acronym stands for. It's the Aeromedical Institute for the Military. It's so basically um, the flight docs. The flight docs that are in charge of issuing waivers and assessing people for their fitness and yeah, flight. Yeah, you gotta get through that. It's the, it was the headquarters for that, which uh, there's a common thing called the NAMI whammy for people going mm -hmm. into the military. Yep. You, you can sign up and you can join and you can show up at OCS and you can be through that process and then get the NAMI whammy. Oh, I have, it's happened to some of my friends, yep, absolutely. And uh, sorry, sorry about your dream, but uh, we just discovered this. And uh, so that was pretty strenuous mm -hmm. and, and I was really put under a microscope in all my mental function, cognitive abilities. And after a couple of days of being interviewed by these independent psychologists that kind of collaborated after the fact, they both came back and said, we believe that you still have the, the attitude and the aptitude to be a pilot should you be able to recover from your other injuries. Um, okay. I did a, a variety of neurological testing as well. Mm -hmm. um, in my first battery of tests, um, I was on a massive amount of these medications mm -hmm. combined with a fresh brain injury, and, and I really struggled to do very simple, and I scored pretty low on a lot of Wait, the things. Wait, so that, this is, this is um, you've been cleared of wrongdoing in the flight, right? You've had your FENAB board. Right. So now it's, okay, I'm, I'm physically in a position, you're, you know, your medical doctor has signed off on your ability to essentially return to some duty, and now you're going to your the aviation specialist doctors and saying, okay, put me back through the ringer so that I can get back in a cockpit at this point, right? Right. And, um, and, and um, it was a very complex yeah, process. But so, and then you still have to yeah, get trained back up. But that, that check down there at, at the, um, at NAMI, um, it took two days and they had a whole board, board review, but they said at the end of it, you're good to go. Right. They did. And so these, what about these memory issues you're talking about now? That was before or after? So I had the memory issues prior and after. Okay, uh, but both. you're still clear. You're good to go, and the, those I issues was. were still fine. There was, uh, you know, there was a massive amount of support from the medical community at Oceana. Mm -hmm. um, this massive support from the community to get me back, and everybody knew how badly I wanted to get back. Mm -hmm. And so there were there were a lot. I had a lot of help getting the medical waivers required, and an issue with the TBI is. Prior to going into the military, we don't take a baseline test. We a don't take brain injury. we don't take a, a thorough um, neurological evaluation. Got the it. way that you get it evaluated so after an injury. Brain. So they only had this picture after the accident. So they didn't really have a baseline. Um, after I had gotten off the medications, I went back and retested, and my scores improved dramatically from where I was initially after the crash. And I think that was enough for them to issue a lot of the waivers that I had. I mean, I had to have waivers for all sorts of the injuries that I had. Um, so they came off the meds that you were on and came out of your body and they said, yep, the things are looking good. Yeah, and, and, and I think I, I kind of proved myself both at the wing. I was, you know, doing a lot of different jobs. I was very busy and involved mm -hmm. there and doing well. And then I also physically was, we would go to command PT and I was, you know, I was a freaking fortunate. I was a PT stud and I could just run circles around a lot of the people there. And I know the Commodore was just like in awe. Like, I can't that believe. That so motivating for everyone to just see you doing that. I mean. Yeah, I mean, my, my scars and everything were still so fresh. So in PT gear, I just had these bright red lines wow. and everything. But, uh, you know, I, I was doing well. And yeah. I was mentally back. And I felt strong. And I had so much Felt support. like your old self? I did. Yeah. I did. And um, when I got back to the, to the RAG or the FRS at VFA 106, I mean, I, 
I was crushing it, man. Like I was doing really well. Like the sim instructors and the instructors both were just like so welcoming to have me back. Awesome. And it really built my confidence back quickly. Um, I did have a couple little mental lapses while flying. Um, one time in a uh, carrier qualification simulator, I flew, was literally the LSO was like, that's the best pass I've ever seen anybody do in the simulator. <laughs> And the next time around, it was like I had this mental lapse for a second, and I almost, uh, I busted through my rat out. Mm -hmm. So, so I had yeah. somehow zoned out just for a few seconds to the point where, you know, I did something without the rat out being there. I could have potentially impacted the ocean. In so real yeah, life. your rat out is a radar altimeter. It's basically a radar at the bottom of the aircraft tells you how high you are, and we set these alarms so that if we accidentally start we descending through it, it's like, oh, hey, I'm descending. And so that was in the back of my mind was concerning, mm -hmm. but largely my mental function felt strong. Okay. Um, and so I completed uh, the RAG. I returned to flying. Uh, I was assigned uh, VFA 136 out in Lemoore, California. And which 136? 136, the Nighthawks. Um, I cruised with them. Yeah. Yeah, 20, uh, 2012 and 20. Okay, that was when they were still in Oceana. They yep. kind of got the and boot. They switched over. They had to send a squadron from Oceana out to Lemoore and... They got yep. the short straw, I guess. We were supposed uh, to go. VFA uh, 11 was supposed to go to the West Coast, and they changed it up. Anyways. Um, but I was back. Um, I was largely feeling good. And little by little, maybe it was the cumulative stress of just squadron lifestyle where you're working pretty dang hard and, and not always getting the best sleep. I started to have more things that I was noticing from memory lapses, issues concentrating, I used to be able to go sit down and read chapters and study and retain the information. Mm -hmm. And I would sit down and I noticed that it was a lot more difficult for me to retain new information. Wow. Um, I kind of pushed through it and uh, I had been at the squadron for a few months and we went on a weapons detachment to uh, Tyndall Air Force Base to do some live fire exercises uh, on some drones. Um, I went out and I got to do uh, an AIM-9 Mike fire, uh, which mm -hmm. is a, a heat-seeking missile. Mm -hmm. And it was against a drone, and I fired a missile at this drone and then afterwards broke off and got to go do some DACT or dissimilar air combat training against an F-22 Raptor oh, very cool. from the, uh, the Hawaiian Raptors squadron happened to be uh, there at the same time as us, which that's got to be like a pretty pretty good gig to have, cool. flying Raptors out of Oahu. Yeah, that's as good as it gets. Um, but uh, afterwards, you know, fought this, uh, another lieutenant, or I guess he's a captain since he's Air Force, but a couple JOs out mm -hmm. fighting some of the coolest aircraft out there. And I remember, you know, seeing this F-22 Raptor coming over the top and doing its Cobra move. Yeah. And, and I was like, I wasn't even thinking about fighting the jet so much <laughs> as I was just like, I can't believe I'm getting to do this with a Raptor right yeah, now. That's um, incredible. I came back from the flight. And I was watching my tapes for the missile shoot, and I realized like I didn't remember almost everything from the missile shoot. Wow! And like that a was live actual missile too, right? Like right. that's a big deal. A like real going missile to an event like that, firing uh, firing at a drone, and so that was concerning. I kind of didn't say much, and the next day I was on duty, uh, just standing at the SDO desk, mm -hmm. answering phones and coordinating the flight schedule, uh, running the radio and everything like that, and. I just continued throughout the next day. It wasn't getting better and I was getting worse. And like that night I went back to the hotel room after standing SDO all day, just trying to like power through. And I remember sitting on the bed and the floor underneath me just started pulsating. I started to get really bad vertigo and I was so dizzy and my anxiety was just spiked. My heart rate was racing and I could not fall asleep all night uh, up to the point where... There had been a, a variety of issues with uh, decompression sickness mm -hmm. in the, the Hornet and Super Hornet community at that time. I'm familiar, yeah. And so I thought maybe I got decompression sickness on my flight. I didn't know what else was going on. It didn't make sense. Like I was feeling great after mm -hmm. my crash and now I'm having these issues. And I contacted the squeezer, the safety officer of the squadron. I was like, hey, uh, hmm. I think I might have gotten DCS on my flight. I'm, I told him some of the things I was having go on and he... Uh, you know, all the department heads and the skipper and XO and everybody came together really quickly and were like, all right, there's a dive base in Mayport, a Navy dive yeah. base, and they have a hyperbaric chamber. So Squeezer drove me uh, with Skipper and we 
we showed up at the dive base and they did a, an assessment and ended up putting me in this pressurization uh, chamber for a few hours over the course of that night. And uh, I, I started to regain, you know, I, I guess I'd describe myself as like a zombie when I showed up. Yeah. I was just flat personality, just had this thousand yard stare. And those are symptoms eyes. of, of decompression sickness. Right. And uh, they squeezed me and I felt a little bit better after. Uh, my sense of humor started to return. And the doc there was uh, a young doc who was brilliant. And he's like, you know, it could have been decompression sickness, but you have a lot else going on in your medical history. So when you get back to Lemoore, I need you to go in and see medical. And for me, that was like, oh, man, the last thing I want to do is go into medical yeah, and in my you. career after all this <laughs> comeback and all the support and the retraining and I was like, this could really let people down. And I didn't oh, want to no. give up, but at the same time, it was like, I, I don't want to injure somebody else. I don't want to crash another jet, another mishap, uh, because I didn't call myself out. And so I spoke with the flight doc when I got back, and he recommended I go see the psychiatry department. Um, and the TBI component, and, and granted, my medical history is so complex, um, and retrospectively, it was very clearly those were likely TBI symptoms, mm -hmm. uh, at least in part. And they kind of bit off on all these diagnoses of psych disorders. Uh, I was uh, classified as uh, delayed onset PTSD. And then they tried a variety of different therapies that were kind of executed half-assed, in my opinion. And quickly, things resulted in me seeing the psychiatrist and being... Uh, put on some psych medications really? um, to try to help me sleep. Insomnia was so bad at that point. I just couldn't sleep. Um, from the lack of sleep, I was getting paranoid. I was getting uh, hypervigilant. But as they started to issue me these pain meds, or the, sorry, the uh, antipsychotic medication for sleep, uh, I was taking a medication called quetiapine. And I started on a fairly low dose, I think of 25 to 50 milligrams per night. And that initially kind of knocked me out at night so I could sleep in the sort of drug-induced coma that it put me in. Um, but as time went on, uh, they had to keep increasing that dose and my psychotic symptoms got to the point where they were talking about schizophrenic diagnoses. Uh, I remember at points I so thought I was... meds uh, making it worse? And, you're, and that's what's going on now? Just and, and at the time, you know, dose. we didn't know. And at the okay. time, it was the meds were the answer, so let's just increase the meds. But the um, symptoms kept getting... But they kept worse getting worse. And I didn't recognize that pattern until a long time after that. But mm -hmm. uh, I got to the point where I thought I was in the Truman Show, where everybody was watching me and recording like me. Like literally, you, like you felt like I felt like was I was that character. Wow. I, I didn't think I was Jim Carrey, but no, I, I was it. like, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah, I thought the radio station wow. was tuned yeah. to me. And I thought people were actors, almost like at Sears School or something, where they were so, watching me wow. and, and, and these they were like fake interactions, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, that's, and, is, uh, that would, that's a stress-reduced response that a lot of people have when they go through that interrogation training that people in our position have to go through. That's an interesting, that's an interesting comparison. Um, and so things just kind of continued to degrade to the point where it was clear I wasn't going to be able to go back flying. I remember going and seeing my XO, and you know I was like, I don't think I'm going to be able to fly again, sir. And he's like, uh, I remember he said, has the psych department already buried their talons into you? Oh, and I was no. like, <laughs> at the time, I didn't really know. I was Shit. like, well, they seem like they're trying to help me. But he meant because they had put me on these drugs. Now, he knew that it was going to be nearly impossible or impossible for me to get back flying. Wow. And uh, So just one incident, hey, go see the doc, and now right. and, you're on and, a path, uh, it seems. And maybe PTSD was a small component of it, but retrospectively, this was largely classic TBI symptoms. And, you know, years later, I've gone through these different treatments and modalities. And had I had those modalities at that moment, mm -hmm. I'd still be flying, I bet, uh, for the Navy. And anyways, things degraded to the point where um, I was going through a medical board to get out of the military. Um, that was a nightmare of a process, uh, mm -hmm. basically being treated like I was faking these symptoms. And despite having this massive stack of medical records, largely from military hospitals. They were just denying and denying. I remember going to see the neurologist at the VA, and I have all this extensive nerve damage, and it's visible. You don't have to be yeah. 
a doctor yeah. to see a lot of it. And I remember the neurologist looked at me. He took out this little pokey wheel and he went like this and he goes, you don't have any issues. And uh, basically ignored. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, and there was a lot of that at the VA. And, uh, um, but eventually I was medically retired. I moved back to Northern Michigan with my wife uh, and my then very young son, uh, Leo. We moved back to Northern Michigan and the, I got in with the VA and my dosage of quetiapine continued to increase. Uh, and shortly after increasing my dose from 300 milligrams of quetiapine a night to 450 milligrams a night, my wife heard me rustling around in the house um, and she found me. I had shaved off almost all my hair on my head in chunks. Wow. I had shaved off my eyebrows for some reason, what facial hair I had at the time. And I was completely naked except I had a black plastic garbage bag tied around my neck. Wow. And <laughs> at least you got style. I thought I, I was gonna go out and fight <laughs> fight crime like <laughs> Batman in the Michigan snowy weather dressed like that. Oh my gosh. So my wife called the VA. The VA is like, we're hanging up, we're calling the police. Uh, oh, a squad boy. car showed up in my driveway with this completely clueless looking deputy wandering out and my wife is like, there's no way in hell we're gonna put him in the back of a police car in the state. So she loaded up my little boy. Luckily my mom was there visiting um, and we started to drive about an hour into Traverse City uh, Hospital where there's an actual ER. And on the drive behind us looked like there had been a nuclear explosion in my mind and there was shrapnel and debris and boats and vehicles tumbling through the air and broken trees and, and all this stuff. It looked like there had been this explosion and it was all completely in my imagination. Um, it's like a reoccurring theme too. It's just like things are just breaking down for you in a sense. It know? was it was hellish, man. Uh, and they got me checked any, in. Like, what's that mean to you? Does that have any, any, have you thought about that? I have. Um, and I'll get into it a little bit okay. as I get into some of the healing, um, okay. if that's cool. Please. Uh, but so they got me into the ER. They checked me in. I ended up in a plexiglass room. I was there for, I think, at least one night, if not a couple. And they got me stable enough to where they put me into an ambulance and drove me down to Battle Creek, Michigan. And I was put into the Battle Creek VA psych ward as oh an inpatient. Goodness. And the hospital made like the hospital just the hospital, the ER, they didn't, they couldn't hold me. Yeah. Like they weren't designed to take long term yeah, psych, psych ward, yeah. and the other psych facilities in the area were all full and they found out I was military. So they're like, oh, well, we send you to the VA. They have a psych facility. So at the time it seemed like the right call. I started to come out of it. I started to gain more lucid moments. Um, like, did you, were you aware like you were actually like in a, like a, some type of like say Jack psychiatric facility or do you? It took a, it just, it took a while. You were in a box at that It took point, me you know? a while to come out of it. And, and yeah. eventually I, I realized I could open the door and I could walk the halls and there were other people there. Oh, wow. But I was in and out of pretty bad psychotic state um, to the point where um, they had to put me on one-on-one -on -one care where I had to have somebody wake me up every 15 minutes with a flashlight in my face to make sure I was okay. That sounds like serious so, it was the same, the same, and this is in moments of being lucid. There were, there were a lot of things there I know that I imagined, but mm -hmm. in the lucid moments I had, I recognized that a lot of the same methods that you would use against an enemy combatant in a prisoner of war situation, they were using the same things on American veterans that were in the psych facility just trying to get better. Wow. The, they, they can find you. You have sleep deprivation because Every one, a psych days. facility is not an easy place to sleep in. There's people yelling and going out of their minds, stomping through the hallways. Everything is this hard tile and hard walls. So everything echoes throughout the room. Even if you have your door shut and you oftentimes had roommates. Um, it's going to make you crazy. You, you get completely sleep deprived. You are malnourished because the food there was abysmal, no nutritional value. There was not fruit or vegetable in sight. Um, everything was just highly processed crap food. You're confined inside. We were lucky if we got to go outside once every three or four days. And when we did go outside, we were put in this small concrete yard that was between the buildings with fences all around it. So it wasn't even this like being prison. outside. This it was. a prison. And there, I mean, were other, it sounds like. there were other veterans there that through their struggles, um, had been in and out of federal prison. 
And I sat down at a meal with a bunch of them and every single one of them agreed that they would way rather be in federal prison than stuck in this VA psych facility because wow. the treatment was better. They got better food. They got to go outside every day. They kind of knew their schedule, um, which was wild to me. You so, get treated better as a, a prisoner. What, uh, so hold on, man. This is such a crazy story here. Now you're in a psych ward in the VA. When were you last in a, a fighter aircraft at this point? How many years had it been? At this point, it had been... Had it been years? It had been about a year and a half, I want to say. So a year and a half, you're you're sitting Maybe around flying years. fighters, and all of a sudden, just like that, you're everything in a degraded psych ward. from just a complete lack of a lack of caring for the TBI that I had that was initially causing the issues. Unbelievable! And snowballed into this pharmaceutical regime that had just tore me apart. Um, now, what about your wife at this point? Where where is she in this story? So she. Um, at this point is very, she's struggling to take care of our little boy and me, and it was a massive strain on our relationship. Um, while I was in the VA facility, um, she moved down to Battle Creek, which is not the nicest place to be. Um, the only hotel that she could afford because there was no stipend or anything for her was um, this rundown motel. Uh, when she got there with my son and my mom, they had to go to the Kmart and purchase um, cleaning equipment because there was this layer of grime all over the floor mm-hmm. in this crappy hotel, and my little boy was crawling around on it. And uh, So she was living in very crappy conditions, and she would come in every day that she could with my boy so I could see them. Uh-huh. And that that saved, my, saved me from going into a very dark place, wow. getting to see them and see that they loved and cared for me still. Um, Man. was powerful. Um, but I got to the point where I recognized how awful this place was. I was voluntarily admitted. And when that happens, I thought you could say, hey, it's time for me to go home. I think I would be better to go elsewhere. But they held me there and said, no, we're not going to let you go yet. We mm-hmm. cannot. We have to wait for this assessment and this. And this went on for weeks and then weeks and weeks. And my family and my mom and dad, they were all trying to get me out of there. My wife had her experience uh, in the ER. My mom was a physician. My dad worked in the medical community. So they had they had the ability to take care of me. Um, and so they were really advocating to try to get me out of there. They realized something's up at this point. I mean, they're like... They didn't, they didn't know that it was to the level because nobody can come in and visit. And even you if you couldn't could... You even have visitors? You, they could visit you, but you had to be taken over to the separate area that wasn't in the psych facility and sit down in these little rooms. Mm. And so they never really saw the facility. And even if you were to walk into the facility, you know, it's, there's fresh paint on the walls, there's corporate art and, oh, yeah, sure. and you know, they're giving people Oreos and Nutter Butters, <laughs> but very under that facade surface of it, it is oh. a train wreck. And I got very frustrated to the point where I started um, talking to other I call them prisoners, other veterans that were in there with me, um, to try to escape. And I started compiling warm clothes and snacks. Get the fuck out of here. And I was making weapons with wet socks inside of other socks in case I needed to fight somebody to get out. And I came up with a plan that I was going to pull the fire alarm. And if they took us outside, a lot of the people there were so out of it from all the drugs that they had been pumped full of for decades. Mm -hmm. Um, they would just be herded back inside like sheep. But for those of us... Th- you were probably thinking you were going to be there for decades at this yeah, point, right? Like, uh, I, don't, I don't blame it you. It didn't look good, man. Uh, and so I pulled the fire alarm one night, and apparently somebody had already tried that trick. And so they <laughs> shut it off. Um, the base police came in. They just shut off the fire alarm. And, huh? uh, and the head nurse there, who was actually a great dude, uh, there was some other staff there that was there for the wrong reasons and had some weird complexes. Uh, mm you ever heard of like the Stanford prison experiments oh, uh, there was a lot of that dynamic going on like wow. we were these problematic prisoners vice American veterans trying to deal with mental health issues um, but the head nurse there Mike I really trusted him and after I pulled the fire alarm he had this syringe and he's like we can do this the hard way or we can do this the easy way and so you know I bent over on a table and I was like stick it in my ass Mike and he, <laughs> he shoved this syringe of uh, Haldol and as it went into my bloodstream, it started to feel like insects were crawling underneath the inside mm. of my skin. 
all I wanted to do was just rip my skin off. I felt incredibly restless. All I could do was pace up and down the hallways, screaming and yelling. Is that the intent um, of that medication? So it's, a, it's an antipsychotic that's supposed to help bring you down if you're really wound up. But the trauma that it causes is so abysmal. It's crazy to me that there's not a better medication to give people. There's got to be something better that doesn't cause that like discomfort. Phys- there's a physical toll it takes. Oh, yeah. The wow. physical pain that you feel on that medication, at least for me, um, was awful and, and traumatic in itself. And after that, though, they, they really made me comply. And they made me take the pills that I didn't want to take. Wow. And they forced me in it to the point where I was drooling on myself. I was just this zombie. And while I was in that state, I was brought into a room with this soulless lawyer and she had me sign documentation declaring me as mentally defective and committing me to the hospital. And because of that, I'm no longer allowed to own or purchase a firearm. And anytime I'm pulled over, I come up on the law enforcement information network as if I had committed a felony. Um, And so that was extremely frustrating. For, for, so what? For what? Um, for just being. For I mean, here you are. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense to me. It's just this um, crazy slide of of just people not helping you, not doing their job. It sounds like just kind of leaving you to fight for yourself. A sense other than your family and your advocates that and they, are trying uh, to support you. Yeah, unfortunately, they were eventually able to get me out and got me back home. And I spent the next six months at home being outside with my kid, getting fresh air, eating a good diet again, getting some exercise. And I slowly came out of that psychosis where I was at. But at that point, the answer was still, hey, we just gotta give you more of this drug and more of this drug. Okay. And I, at the time, I could barely do the dishes and I could hardly read a paragraph without forgetting it. But I stumbled through the book, How to Change Your Mind by Michael Pollan, which is uh, a really well done book on the use of psychedelic medications for healing mental health ailments. Mm. And to me, like a light bulb came on, like that's the direction I need to go because the only other option I've been giving for the VA now for years is to be on these psych medications the rest of my life that were, they had me just numb and angry wow. and yelling at my little boy just for trying to play it, play with them and uh. just, at this point, my relationship with my wife was very close to divorce, and we had already talked about divorce and how we were going to, you know, do it. And did I, you uh, did you like understand that decision from her perspective, or oh, was it I did. kind of a, I did. I wow. was I was so broken and just beat down at that point that I was just I understood. I felt like she was this bird stuck in a cage, and I had put her Gosh. there. Um, but uh, I found this psychedelic medication and I found someone to administer a ceremony with me. And I came out the other side of that. It didn't cure everything, but to use uh, Michael Pollan's explanation, it was like this fresh snowfall on these entrenched ruts that I had been sledding or skiing down my whole life. These negative emotions that were so entrenched that they had just consumed me. And with that fresh snowfall, it filled in those ruts and I was able to start taking new paths down the fresh powder uh, of the mountain of my life. And I started to make the correlation of those medications. Every time they increased them and changed the dosage, I got worse and worse. And so against the advice of the psychiatry department at the VA, against the advice of my wife and my family, I decided to wean myself off of quetiapine. And it took a few months, but I slowly got a little better and a little better. My sleep was absolutely awful. Like I could not sleep hardly without it. Um, and I discovered wow. uh, an organization called Vet Solutions. And, well, hold uh, on a minute. So sure. you're telling me that you're that you're out of the you're out of the the psych ward from the VA because your your wife's supporting you and your family's supporting you. It basically pulled you out of it. Yeah. And then had to fight. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then you you're like, well, I'm actually going to stop taking my medication. And, 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 and it created a tremendous amount of stress in my relationship with my family and my wife because they all thought, you know, they had, they've heard the narrative, oh, here's a psych patient getting yeah. off his meds. Yeah. We know what happens every soap opera or whatever. Maybe your wife has seen it before you, at the hospital that she right. worked at. That, I mean, um, wow. But I was so desperate. I, I, and I, something was telling me that was the right direction. And uh, my friend, Matt, he gave me the book called Finding Ultra by Rich Roll. 
and that's his story of going from this sort of life as a corporate lawyer and stressed out and drinking too much to just disconnecting from all that and using plant-based diet mm -hmm. and exercise to mm -hmm. heal and becoming this ultra endurance athlete. Um, and that was a huge motivation for me to, I had eaten, I had eaten fairly healthy, but I really went hard into the health and the nutrition, the exercise, the, you know, the gut microbiome. I start. I read, uh, Brain Maker by Dr. Perlmutter, and I just started. My brain was coming back on without all these uh. drugs hindering it. I was able to just start and you consuming were off, you all were these off books. of the pharmaceuticals at that point, mm -hmm. or you're tapering off. And it was through the process of tapering off, my mental function improved. Mm -hmm. um, I had exercised while I was on quetiapine, and as I had come off, it felt like I had been training with a hundred pound ruck on my back. Wow. And I remember going out running and my heart rate was way lower and I was running way faster. And it was like this weight was lifted off my body. I don't know what that medication was doing to my physiology, how it was poisoning me. If it was histotoxic hypoxia of that stuff, mm -hmm. just overwhelming my cells with junk. Um, but as I came off of it, I started to regain a lot of my abilities and, um, Memory? Memory improved. Wow. Um, and eventually I started to get a little bit of sleep uh, without the medication. And I found this organization called Vet Solutions, which is uh, a former Navy SEAL, um, Marcus Capone and his wife Amber started this after he saw the incredible impact that psychedelic medication had on his uh, injuries from years of very high level combat uh, with the SEAL teams. And that really piqued my interest. I reached out to their program to try to get become part. I didn't really qualify because mm. the you know the way they explain it, it's like Schindler's List. Like they want to be able to help everybody, but they only sure. have so much funding yeah. to send people. And their focus is healing operators, guys with two or more combat deployments uh, in the special forces community, which I was neither of those things. Mm -hmm. But I got it's a email. pretty common issue. I mean, traumatic brain injury in the military is a, a very serious issue, and it's also one that you can't just look out and see, you know? So right. it's, it's a tricky. It's tricky. And uh, I, I didn't... They, they sent me an email, and they put me in touch with an organization called Warrior Angels Foundation. Hmm. And this is run by a former Green Beret and his brother, who was a, an Apache attack helicopter. Cool. And they started this organization to promote more holistic healing for people. And they were doing this event. It was the four by four by 48 challenge uh, off the, out of the mind of David Goggins where you run four miles every four hours for 48 hours straight. And uh, I saw they were doing a fundraiser for the event and I just had this urge to share my story. And I, I did a brief synopsis on their fundraiser page about what had happened to me. And I didn't have any social media at this point but I just started texting the link to a few friends. And before I knew it, it had just spread like wildfire. And my, hmm. my fundraiser page had raised over $10,000 in like a week. Nice. And, uh, <laughs> and so I got a call from Adam, uh, the Apache pilot. And he's like, hey, man, your, your story is incredible. We really want to fly you down. And they flew me down to Texas for the event. Hmm. And I participated in the event, running the four miles every four hours. And each time I was running with a different group and it was largely people from the operator community. There were mm -hmm. SEALs and Green Berets and MARSOC Marines and, and all these guys had very similar stories. I mean, completely different ways that they were injured, but they had these TBIs and then they went down the path of these psych meds that made them far worse. And they had recognized, like me, that they that was not the answer. And so I finally had this confirmation that I was on the right you. path. And, and it wasn't just uh, you. And it wasn't just me. And, and just the community and the camaraderie that was built over those two days um, was incredible. And, and it put me on this whole new trajectory in my life. It reignited the hope that like I was meant for something good still, that I didn't have to be this miserable, drug-addicted shell of a human that I had been before. And um, they put me in contact with uh, Heroic Hearts Project, uh, which is run by Jesse Gould. He's a former Army uh, Ranger. And he put together Heroic Hearts Project to send veterans uh, to do ayahuasca and psilocybin uh, retreats. And he sent me down to Peru. And over the course of a week, I had, 
I guess the best way I can explain it in short is like a soul surgery. It was like all that darkness and everything that had built up over the years of everything that I'd been through was was resolved in so many ways. And, just uh, just like that. I mean, you just felt that. I came weight out come and off. it was like I had the energy and I had a smile on my face again. I didn't before. You know, people were afraid of me. I looked just had this look in my face like I was this angry human being, which I was. And afterward, I saw pictures of myself, and it was like there's that childhood version of me that was still under there. And uh, that was hugely healing. And then uh, another organization, Defenders of Freedom, they funded me to go down to the Resiliency Brain Clinic in Dallas, Texas, where, again, I met an incredible group of these other humans, uh, largely rangers and uh, special forces types that had had the same story. And over the course of two weeks at this TBI clinic, they ran this massive blood panel on me. Um, and they actually looked at my physiology to see what was all off. What's really common with TBI is for you to have hormonal imbalances. Mm. And before, you know, the VA had done some blood tests, but they were so they were so minimal. And even once they did have my testosterone levels and things, they were comparing me to like 80-year-old veterans <laughs> that were there. And they didn't just they didn't even have the scale to compare it to to yeah. say, oh yeah, your testosterone is actually extremely low for your age. Mm. And they took this this snapshot of my physiology. They did a bunch of neurological testing and they really looked deep into my case. And over the course of the week of largely doing things as simple as these eye exercises where I would follow a dot with my eyes up and down as your eyes are an extension of your brain. Mm. And that helped to heal my brain. There was a a bunch of other modalities. Putting wires back together, huh? Yeah, they did... um, they did one uh, a modality called transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is uh, basically a Tesla coil that they put right up against uh, your frontal lobe and mm-hmm. pulse it. And they use different pulses on the right and left hemispheres of your brain. But after seven minutes on that machine, so much of my anxiety was settled and wow. I was clear and focused. Uh, and after between the ayahuasca retreat and that brain clinic, I came home and I was sleeping again wow. for eight hours a night without any medications. And, uh, and since then, you know, I've been on this incredible journey of all these opportunities have been opened up, speaking to people like yourself, the podcasting, done corporate speaking, uh, writing. Uh, it's like I have my life back again. Um, so you're now writing a book, is that correct? So correct. In, about a year and a half ago, you essentially could not read yeah. <laughs> because of these psych meds. <laughs> Believe it or not, And you're I was working on your own book right now. And uh, That's awesome. And, you know, doing a lot to heal my relationship with my family and my wife and and rebuilding everything that was, you know, she went through hell. She went into hell to pull me out and it's, it scarred her. And you guys are still together? We're still together. Wow. Um, Congratulations. We have a new baby girl. Uh, She's 18 months old now or 19 months old now. And, you know, it's like we're getting a, a new chance at life that we just we got to the point where we were almost so hopeless that that was never going to happen. Um, but it's, it's been a wild ride, man. Glad you um, made it, brother. Thanks, brother. It's good to be here talking to you. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks so much. My pleasure.